Okay, welcome everybody. Um, it's wonderful to see an audience here to our first Monsoon Assemblages Symposium, um, titled Monsoon and Other Airs. If I could just give some introduction to this, my name is Lindsay Bremner and I'm leader of this ERC grant funded project called Monsoon Assemblages, which is looking at the changing monsoon and rapid urbanization in three South South Asian cities. And as part of the grant, we're running three symposiums, one every year for the next three years, on the monsoon. This first one is on monsoon air. Next year, we'll be having a symposium on monsoon water, and the third year on monsoon ground. And the idea is just to use these three elements of the monsoons in order to problematize and reconceptualize the kind of meaning and agency of the monsoon in people's lives, in politics, in technology, in visualization, and so on. So that's really the ambition of these, these three symposia. We will be having a um, series of publications online about the, the proceedings of the symposia, and the program for this symposium is in these little booklets which are circulating. Please do take one. Okay, um, we have a small exhibition on the side which you're welcome to look at after um, Sean's keynote lecture that just starts, uh, some of the work is, uh, in fact all of the work is by people who are speaking at the sym symposium tomorrow. There is some work by my students at the back and then the video in the middle is actually a video by some Chennai students who we met when we went on our field trip to Chennai last year. So that by way of, of an introduction. Um, and now I'd like to introduce you to our keynote speaker tonight, who is Sean Lally. We're really welcome. Thank you for coming to be with us tonight, Sean. It's a, a real honor to have you here. Um, Sean is an architect. He's based in Chicago, Illinois. He holds a Bachelor of Landscape Architecture degree from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and a Master of Architecture from the University of California, Los Angeles. As I say, he is currently an Associate Professor at the College of Architecture, Design and Arts at the University of Illinois and formerly taught at the Rice School of Architecture in Houston, Texas. Sean has won some prestigious prizes in his career, including the Rome Prize for Landscape Architecture at the American Academy in Rome, and the Architecture League of New York Prize for Young Architects and Designers. And if anyone knows the American landscape, that's a really key prize to win as a young architect. He was also awarded a Graham Foundation grant for his book, The Air from Other Planets, published in 2014. Um, and he's also a full-time teacher, um, as well as being prin principal of his practice, Weathers, which was set up in 2005. Sean has recently hosted a series of podcasts titled Night White Skies, which is also the title of his lecture this evening, which engages a diverse range of perspectives on architecture's future, including conversations with philosophers, cultural sorry, cultural anthropologists, policy makers, scientists, and science fiction writers. And I think it's this interdisciplinary approach to architecture's future, which is really what overlaps with the ambition of monsoon assemblages. Just before I hand over to Sean, we also have a bookstall at the back, which is kindly manned by our bookshop manager, with some of the books that speakers this evening Sean's book is on sale, and I'm sure you'll sign it if, if people want you to. But there are other books on sale by participants in the symposium tomorrow. Thank you very much. Over to Sean. OK. So uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, a big thank you to Lindsay for the invitation to even come and do this. So thanks for thinking of me. And I hope in some way this does the rest of the symposium justice in terms of introducing uh, the work here. And so what I, I thought I'd start off talking about was, uh, and again, as it was mentioned, this is the, the title of a, of a podcast that, I, that I've begun, but this really is not tied in any way to that. It's, it's really just a name that I think I've had now for over 10 years. I don't 
people work in different ways. I like titles, and then I work backwards to like what to do with that title. So the book there from other planets, I think, is a title that I scribbled down in 2004. It was the name of a song I heard on the radio from <laughs> from something in the 1970s or 60s, and then you just find some ways to um, kind of live up to the title in a way. And so with this, with the night white skies, uh, what I wanted to kind of start off with was this. This book that I had read, that it's not really about that book in any way, but it's, it's by uh, David Biello. It's called The Unnatural World. And it's a good book. And within the book, it, it covers uh, quite a few things. A lot of it has to do with what are we doing within the world landscapes? What are we doing with climate change? How do we address this? Basically, how do we prepare that, this, us, to pre how do we prepare to live in the world that's being created, not vice versa? Um, but one of the parts that came out of this conversation and in the book was a conversation in which he went to this conference called SIFO, which is in, within the United States, and it's a series of people within the sciences and engineering, and they come together and they talk about science and engineering and how they're going to make new advancements in the world and, and talk about uh, climate change and things like this. And so one of the quotes that, that came from that conference where he was still interviewing for this book and having conversations, he overheard this question by Larry Page, who's the CEO of Google, you know, talking to some people, having a conversation, and I think the quote was, if you had $50 million, what would you spend it on? Tell me what we should be doing. And I thought, like, well, how, what a, what a profound question, and I don't know about you, but I've never been in a room when someone asked me what I could do with $50 million, but it definitely does raise the question of, thanks for asking, Larry. Um, I'd love to have that, that opportunity to talk about that. And I think one of the reasons that, that that conversation came up, and one of those questions that came up, was a project that was at Google called RE less than C, which is renewable energy being less expensive than carbon. Um, and what they can do to think about um, taking technological advancements so we can curb climate change. So this idea that the, but at 350 million uh, parts per million is this level of, of CO2 in the atmosphere, and if we can stay below that, we can understand and recognize the Earth we live in as it has been in the last 100 years. As we exceed that, we're going we're gonna to have new variables in terms of climate change that we aren't, we're not prepared for. As of, I think, today, or I think even last year, that was at 400. So well beyond the amount of carbon in the air that, that is sustainable. And so what Google set off to do in 2007 was think, how can we actually curb this? How can we work with um, and incentivize industry to actually start looking at renewable energy and can we curb that, that CO2 output and what would that do? They came to us, they published eventually their findings, which are less findings and more how did we, what can we learn from this? Because they shut it down three years later. And so when Google tackles a problem and basically decides they can't fix it, I think it's kind of an eye-opening moment to think about what's going on out there. I should also say, this is, pri this is a prior to Trump 2016. So whatever they thought the kind of arc was in terms of climate change, in terms of the, the kind of steady as we go, that steady as we go is actually an aggressive move compared to policy being in place now. So that steady as they go is actually um, nowhere to be seen now um, when the head of Exxon runs the EPA. Um, so what they wound up doing was realizing that if they could actually curb that by 55%, reduce that CO2 output, by working with a series of technologies that aren't even available right now, but are plausible, and they got that in the hands and they could incentivize people to do it, that that 55% decrease wouldn't actually have an impact in the CO2. We've already gone beyond that. That's going to be in the atmosphere for 100 years. So in a weird way, that they realized that A, they couldn't produce that technology that they were hoping for, and B, they couldn't incentivize coal and um, uh, natural gas to actually use this because the, the, the cost wouldn't be there. And so they actually shut it down and started thinking, what then can we do to think about um, climate change and how do we play a role in that? And so why I found that to be an interesting question is because quite clearly when he's asking, tell me what we should be doing, he's definitely thinking in terms of technology. They're definitely thinking in terms of technological problems that can be solved. And in reality, I think you start to st start having different ways in which as an architect, if you were in that role, I could never sit there and tell him I have a technological advancement that can solve his problems. Um, and I don't think that's a strong suit of architecture, and I don't think that's something that I can bring to the table. But I do think there is a way in which you can have a conversation with people about 
setting a dialogue in place for the general public and for those around us to actually have a conversation about climate change, about a changing environment, about these technologies and what it's going to mean for, for Earth and how we're living. And so one of the examples I could point to that I think is a great example is this hieroglyph project. And this is something at Arizona State University. And it started by these two individuals at another conference called Present Tense talking to each other. The man on the right is Neil Stevenson. If, you, if anyone is familiar with him, he's a, an author, a science fiction writer. Um, and Michael Crow, president of Arizona State University. And their conversation went a little something like this, which was Neil Stevenson being on this panel, talking about future tense, lamenting the world that was never pro provided for him as a child, talking about this is the same year, more or less, in which the space shuttle is terminated as a program. And he's thinking about all the things that, like, lamenting that just the big ideas that just haven't come to fruition. And, and in many ways, he's pointing the fingers at the scientists. He's pointing the fingers at the engineers and saying, these were things that were promised to me and they were never delivered. Um, in a great response from Michael Crow, the president, it was like, actually, it's you as a fiction writer that's failed us. He's like, you need to start providing um, stories that are not dystopic or utopic, but are actually can, people can get behind and, and use as models for advancement, use as models for inspiration. And I think it was a kind of a great eye-opening moment, both for him as an author, but also anyone who was reading this, the kind of the realization that that, that is a huge part of, of our world, is being able to, to tell not just stories, but actually show opportunities and potential futures that otherwise may not exist. And that both that does two things. A, as they state, is kind of inspires a group of people to want to move into the sciences, move into engineering, and tackle these problems. But it also inspires people to realize that they could be living slightly differently. And we know this because when we think about anything tied to energy or anything tied to the environment, it has generally to do with conservation, sustainability, and a moral good. Those are all important things, but they're also very limiting because they're, they basically take a snapshot of today as if that's what we're holding on, white knuckle to produce forever, when in reality, as we've seen with 400 million parts uh, per million, that's, that's out of the bag. And so I bring this up because I do also think that there's a little bit of an affinity to the architect to the science fiction writer. And, I, and I, th I think there's that moment in which prior to this interaction between the two of them, and I'm speaking, I'm putting words in, in uh, Neil Stevens's mouth here, I do think there's probably a bit of an insecurity as to what his role was in writing and what his role was in terms of inspiring people to, to move forward. And I think that's, in, a, in some ways, something that architects, I know from speaking for myself, struggle with, which is we're not scientists, we're not mechanical engineers, we're not software engineers. There are always people who know more about those sciences than we do, yet at the same time, we're given this opportunity, I think, or responsibility to start thinking about how do we shape the environment we live in, because at the end of the day, it is the architects, it is the landscape architects, planners, that get involved in actually making these spaces that we occupy. Um, and so one of the, the moments that they came up with, and one of the things he points to that makes this so complicated, as I just listed off all those professions, is that as someone who comes out of the sciences moves into industry, they generally become one part of a much larger team. So if you're working in, in the chemistry, if you're working in sciences, you generally finish your PhD and, and then work on within, say, a private sector, one particular problem and a much bigger problem, because it is so complex. And that is, again, going back to architecture, not unlike what we do today. So if you pull up any image from, from your favorite architect, favorite designer, and start realizing of any large-scale project, this being Coupe Hemme Blau's uh, BMW Well, I mean, you start to see this is the architectural office of Coupe Hemme Blau. These are all the people that are necessary to make that thing work. And so when you start looking at the architect or the designer, there's, there's something very similar happening in a way. If you look back to the 15th century, someone like um, looking at um, the Duomo in Florence, this idea of, of being the architect that does both the engineering, does the, the architecture, does some of the designing, is involved in the tools that make the infrastructure, that actually set up the logistics to get the materials there. Um, this is a very brief history of, of, um, of design. Or in the 18th century where engineering and architecture in the Beaux-Arts kind of splits this is during a time in which materiality is shifting when steel and iron are coming into, into use more and more. And then in today, and this is just a quick survey, if you look on the, the right, these are professional institutions. So architecture, and they skip around a bit, but the American Institute of Architects founded in 1857. 
Landscape Architects, 1899. Planners in the United States, 1978. Um, interior designers in the United States, I think there's four states currently that require to be licensed before you can practice. Um, so this is, it's basically, an, uh, this isn't a, a history lesson, this is a current condition. Structural engineers in London, um, 1908. Civil, acoustic, mechanical, electrical. And then these are institutes that you don't even have to be a professional licensing to do, but are required to produce a large project, whether it's the photovoltaic plants, wind studies, graphic consultants, lighting designs, fire protection, uh, cons uh, facade consultants. I mean, this, goes, this list goes on and on. And so what does then the role become of a designer when something that's so complicated in terms of codes and legal requirements as well as special specialties in order just to produce it, the knowledge, when this is kind of what we're looking at? And what I even included on here, at least in the United States, it's called LEED, which is certification in energy. Like how do you manage uh, conservation and, 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 um, and energy systems for sustainability? And each country has a different, different term for it. And that's not even listed on here. So the question then becomes, how do, we, how do we think about these things without being another specialty? So how can you talk about the environment and energy and not be a subset of this, but actually go back? Is it possible to even start thinking like, can these be things that we think of in a larger system that we tackle and not become a subset of a larger problem. And there's, you know, I figured I'll talk about projects in London since I know half as much as you guys do living here. Um, but there are plenty of examples, some that are built and some that are not, like Cedric Price's uh, Fun Palace that very specifically address technologies of the time that look at things like advancements in cybernetics, advancements in artificial intelligence in the 60s, um, psychiatry, uh, broadcasting, media, and actually bring these things together as well as the, so the uh, societal changes of the time, like um, post-war drops in, in, um, in labor and availability of jobs. And so people with more free time, people who are working half shifts, what do we do with a kind of changing cultural landscape? What do we do with the fact that we have new technologies available to us? And I think the Fun Palace is a perfect example of not only was it a project that he essentially invented, meaning there was no client for this. He had a collaborator with him. Um, and if, as time went on, this collaboration got larger and larger and larger. It wasn't until 10 years later that the project was eventually um, ended. But it was no shortage of, of interest. And these interests, I mean, this is um, uh, Gordon Pask uh, from within cybernetics, a huge name. By the time that subcommittee, of many subcommittees he had, he had over 20 members just in, in uh, cybernetics. Meaning he was using these advancements as tools that helped him better understand the work that he was looking at. So his ideas of how do you create open, flexible spaces like a theater that people could move in and engage for recreation, for education, and for learning, but at the same time allow these to be early, st early examples of what we understand now in terms of the internet, the web, um, everything like this in terms of being able to get patterns of people's behavior, learn from that, provide new opportunities for them. These are all early forefronts of that that, again, was never built, but nonetheless, he was able to lead those through a design project to give new ideas that weren't just about form, but were also cultural as well. And again, you know, looking at everything from the Crystal Palace, um, that these, again, are ways in which when new technologies and new materials come forward, whether that be concrete, steel, glass, plastic, those aren't created, those materials, the architect didn't invent any of those materials. But what the architect does do very well is actually find new ways to manipulate those materials, both in terms of form, but in terms of skewing them to social pressures that exist at the, today. So the perfect example of saying the, these, the large, um, uh, the Crystal Palace or any of these uh, large cultural projects that were in France and England was that they, they do two things. They work with new materiality that happened at the time, so glass, prefabrication, um, iron and steel. And they created new structures and new forms and new, and new spatial configurations. Things that coincided with things like the Industrial Revolution, like uh, nationalism and um, uh, colonization of new plants and new materials, bringing things from around the world, plants that don't exist here, bringing them back, finding ways to then display them and represent them. So they create these large holes, holes that could actually be built in six months. I mean, all these things are, are ways in which the architect or the designer can merge both technological advancements with social pressures that are occurring to create new forms and new typologies. And so the question then, in my interest, is to say, you know, where does that leave us today? So what, what, what are 
op opportunities in which we can think about that make architecture or society or conditions today unique that maybe didn't exist previously. Um, and so for me, I think when a lot of people talk about design or talk about architecture, I think you, could, you can romanticize things in the past, whether that past is the near past or whether it's the far past of the Renaissance or predating that. But at the also time is realizing like, what, what, can a, what, your, what can your contribution be today to pressures that exist now? And so without a doubt, those two biggest pressures that, that I think I would identify and say are, are big issues are one, the fact that we willfully manipulate the environment, whether we plan to or not, whether we're aware, from, aware of it or not. And two is that we are manipulating the human body. So whether that be wearable technologies, healthcare, or bioengineering. And that's a kind of unique moment in time because for the most part, when people think about the body in, in architecture, we think about we learn more about the body and the more we learn about the body, the more it shapes the architecture we produce. So we learn about the eye, antithesis, the idea like the Greeks understanding how columns and, and the weakness of an eye, and so you actually bulge a column or you, and you bulge the interior of a large temple and it corrects the, the deficiency of what the eye produces. We look at the circulatory system, if we look at optics, if we look at um, genetic sequencing. I mean, these are all in a, you know, current conditions in which we've learned more and more about the body. But just we've seen that even if you think about something, and I'll, I'll get this into a minute, but two of these greatest pressures in society are manipulation of the human body, and the environment. Um, the first is changing the makeup of the physical space we occupy, and the second, the very body that perceives that space. Why is that important? Because at the intersection are the physical boundaries that define architectural space. The focus is to integrate these two quickly advancing industries as the epicenter of architectural spatial, social, environmental, and ethical discourse. So for the most part, when someone, I think there's a, yeah. So generally speaking, when you think about architecture, we generally think about architectural form, right? So pink would be how you would think about architectural form. And its relationship to the environment is that of mediating. And so Rainer Banham talks about this in Architecture of the Well-Tempered Environment, is that you decide what energy gets in, you decide what energy gets bounced back, and you decide what energy can be absorbed by it. So this would be a window or a porch, this would be rain screens, this would be um, concrete or adobe structures that would take that heat, hold it all day, send it back in. So it kind of mirrors it at, the, at, the, at night when the temperatures were dipped, this would get warm. And the third, fourth that's not here would be sealing it off completely for mechanical conditioning, right? So mechanical and air conditioning. And this is really just a question of saying, well, what if we stop looking at this as how we define architecture in terms of our aesthetic and our spatial configurations? and actually start looking at the, the energies that move through the space. And so in that case, architecture becomes an amplification of the energy systems, not simply looking at a geometric form, an ossified piece of energy that then mediates the environment, but actually uses those environments to actually become architecture itself. And one of the examples that I think is always a great one to point to would be street lighting. Street lighting is nothing more beyond the pole and the bulb is that a form of energy? And that form of energy is tuned directly to the human body, right? So our human bodies perceive energy between 450 microns to 730, and then that is red to blue, you know, red to purple. And that's what our, our eyes are tuned to, primarily because that's the most, that's most of what comes down from, from the sun. And so when we look at light, this is tuned not to all the spectrums of the light. It's not tuned to reproduce the sun. So we're not reproducing a natural environment. We're producing an artificial environment, and that environment has an interior that gives you safety, allows commerce, allows recreation. It has an edge, so it has a shape to it that we recognize as a boundary, which is what architecture has. We, we need boundaries and edges. That's the kind of hallmark of architecture, whether it be on the ground, the concrete, the window, or in this case, light. And it has shapes, you know, so it has typologies. It's kind of like a little necklace here of discrete pieces, or it's a complete flooding of an environment. And so we know that prior to street lighting, things like our parks, the public spaces would essentially shut down. And when that kind of came into it, it didn't reproduce the day at night. It actually produced an entirely new, new space that people could have that provided, the, like I mentioned, recreation, commerce, and uh, safety. So that becomes you know, the most mundane way. If you're just looking at light, and you're just looking at the human body, tuning that light to that body, 
to produce space, to produce an interior. And this is not something that, and this is something that's continually moving forward. So when we think about this, and for the lack of a better term, when we're talking about energies, um, and we're talking about building with them, I'm just referring to them as a material energy, meaning something in which energy doesn't, the flip side of that would be to say, you know, you build a space like this, or anything other with a kind of geometric form, and then you think of energy as the thing that fills it, like a tire. You know, it produces a degree of comfort. But the architectural shape is defined by the walls and the geometry. The energy is nothing more than the thing that kind of fills it up so that you feel comfortable, right? So that we have a light level that you can see this at. But with a material energy, is to think that this is what takes the role of other materials to actually build physical space. And so this goes on from things that are being advancements now in lighting, uh, sound, and even in storage and harnessing energy. So this is Tesla's battery pack, their gigafactory that they're building in Nevada that's, I guess, essentially complete now, or the work they're doing with Tesla to actually store um, energy both with, in cars but also within the domestic home. Uh, sound, this is something, unfortunately, most of these advancements come from weaponry. <laughs> uh, everything from Charles and Ray Eames' uh, wood casts, pliable uh, plywood, that you have for beautiful chairs that we're sitting in now comes from, from casts that they worked on for, with the government for um, taking soldiers out of the field. And so that was done by a government commission through DARPA. Um, but stuff like this, which is sound, in which it's not about producing sound that we're seeing here. In this case, it's weaponized down to a laser that can actually hit um, a pirate in the back of a ship. So if you're being boarded, you shoot this at somebody. It doesn't kill them. It just causes so much pain that they eventually turn around. Um, but sound is actually being used also for, um, I think two great examples were both the, um, in the United States, the Republican Democratic National Conventions in which you'd see a little beam of light here and you would stand in front of it and it would give a, a speech of a president. And you would send another beam here and it would be a different speech. You wouldn't, the other people wouldn't hear it. It was just cones of sound because you can control sound to such a degree that you could have an open space like this with 35 TVs. And so someone like in furniture, Herman Miller or Steelcase, can have an open plan. You don't go back to these ideas of uh, cubicles. You could actually all be working in an open place with different sound hitting different, different spaces. You'd all be tuned to different TVs. And as you move in and out of them, you have different sounds. So it's not about creating structural walls. It's actually about creating sound through a space through sound itself by sculpting sound. And this is probably the one I interact in the most, which is in Chicago, which is far infrared light that they put inside the stations and the trains when you're waiting outside in the freezing cold. Um, and it gives off far infrared light that hits the body, um, comes in contact with the water molecules in your skin and vibrates and gives a perception of warmth. The great irony here is that everyone is so cold, everyone bundles up to the fourth ninth degree sitting under these and really all they're getting is basically excess uh, heat that's, that is being produced. And if they'd actually taken off their hood and loosened their collar and actually got that far infrared light to their skin, they'd actually feel a, a more extreme difference. It's just that we don't know how to interact with the, some of the technologies that are even moving because they move so quickly. And so when we think about material energies, we're familiar with them at the, in, in many ways. So if you look at this outer ring, I'd say these are ways in which you think about, say, light as in a theatrical event. You know, it's something that, that creates an effect, an aura, everything from um, you know, basically something that is where geometry is still doing the main work, but a kind of byproduct emerges that would be kind of theatrical. Or comfort control. So in the early 1900s, late, 18, uh, late 19th century, using heating and cooling as a way of providing uh, comfort in spaces that you could otherwise not live or produce or manufacture. But when you start getting into a material energy, whether they be thermodynamic, chemical, acoustic, electromagnetic, you actually start to get a range of them. So Trophic would be any type of energy that is good for the human body. So that would be like saying using uh, blue spectrum light as a way of getting vitamin D in the winter when there's not enough sunlight. That's stuff that would nourish the body and give you, give you wellness. Uh, informational material energy would be like a street light, meaning you see the light. I physically see that. I know that's where I want to be. But if I ran through it, no harm would come to me. It's informational, but it's not causing any physical interaction. And the last would be physical, meaning the same way you think about a wall, a plate glass. The plate glass, I see outside, but if I run as fast as I want to, I will be stopped. That's similar to, say, that sound beam, right, where it produces something you don't see, but when that comes in contact with you, it actually causes a physical um, stoppage. 
And then the mirror version of this is this idea of augmented sensory perception. So how do, how do our human bodies perceive space? So we're looking at that street light. That's only because our bodies are tuned to a very particular spectrum of light. But what if our bodies could actually move just to the left and just to the right of that spectrum and see infrared light or see ultraviolet light? Then all of a sudden you have a new, sense, a new group of materials to control space with. That sounds a little far-fetched, but just keep in mind that everything from hearing to sight, for the most part, for hundreds of years has been about correcting deficiencies at birth or through trauma to bring them back to a so-called average, right? So 20-20 vision or a certain amount of, of what you can hear. Um, and so we did that with, contact, with uh, glasses, we did it with contacts, we've done it with LASIK. And now if you go in the military or anything like that, they tweak you beyond 2020. They can actually go beyond that condition. And so quite often when doctors are working, whether it's with hearing or whether it's with sight, it's not whether a doctor can go beyond that condition, it's whether it's ethically correct to do that. And so, and we all know, if you can do it, we will do it. Um, it's like the big question about cloning. Will we clone something? 25 minutes later, Dolly exists, right? So it's like, we know we're going to go these directions, and these directions are, are not even in one industry. So whether you're talking about research institutes like uh, the University uh, of the Republic of Korea, Seoul National Universities, this is an artificial arm, but it's not, an, it's not the appendage that's the revolution here. It's actually the sensory perception on the fingers that sense pressure. So he, the, the individual holding it doesn't know they're holding a cup just because the cup's in their hand. They hold it because they can actually sense pressure change in the hand. Um, you have Kevin Warwick, um, who is um, uh, you know, an early cyborg version, someone who's done a lot of do-it-yourself work. This is something which he provides, actually investigates new senses. So this is someone who actually had done work by connecting into their central nervous system, which turns out to be very malleable and much more plastic than we think it is, and can actually create a sensor that connects from uh, sonar. So he actually produced sonar, closed his eyes, had him kind of taped shut for a week or two, um, and actually managed to sense, by directly going into a central nervous system, sonar movements, and he could actually sense space in his lab in his home. Um, this is the same type of experiment where, I don't know if you've ever seen this, where they take glasses that flip your world upside down, you wear them, it's a miserable experience for two days, then the third day you wake up and everything's been corrected. Because your mind has figured out the, the, the difference between the two and actually it's corrected for it. And then you take them off and it's still everything's upside down until another two days go by and then your eyes flick them back. And so, you know, this is just, these are experiments, whether they be at universities, whether they be, again, at universities, but not within the sciences, probably closer, within, um, actually, I'm not 100% sure what department he's in. Um, or this is stuff, this is a great uh, example where this is pharmaceutical. So we know pharmaceutical-wise, if you want to talk about, the most ex easy example is, say, weightlifting, right? We have people, Mr. Uh, Mr. All-American, Mr. Natural, whatever it is, that you have these weightlifting competitions and bodybuilding, and at least now in the States, I know you have two separate versions. You have all natural, and then you have do whatever you want. And you can see the two when you look at them, who's all natural and who's not. But the point is to see how far you can kind of push the boundaries of what the physical mass of the body can be. But this is also being done um, for uh, neuroenhancers. So Nature Magazine did a study several years back questioning how many scientists use propranolol or modavifenol. Like these are uh, beta blockers to actually enhance their performance when they're working. Because it's so, the pressure is so extreme to get grants and to publish that it's no different. Like you need to stay up in a couple, couple extra days, you need to be a little sharper, you need to concentrate longer. And I think the number was 35% of all scientists that they, that they surveyed use these drugs, which are not meant for that, um, to actually just increase their, their neural uh, networks. And of course the most extreme version are do-it-yourselfers like this gentleman here who puts chlorine in his eyes, um, chlorophyll analog, that turns his eyes black, and for 20 minutes at night, he can actually see um, ultraviolet light at night. So he goes outside, and he can actually see for a period of time before it wears out, and hopefully doesn't keep his eyes black. So the, you're talking about a wide range of, um, of experiments. And so when we think about the body, and maybe a kind of gross analogy comparison would be, if we think about the body, generally we would think about it in terms of gender, or size, or height, in proportion, right? So thinking of uh, Leonardo's um, Vitruvian Man drawn out, which was really, 
a knowledge that came from dissecting cadavers and learning more about, illegally, learning more about, so again, it's, not, it's never legal occupation that occurs, it's subversive. Um, learning how bones and joints connect together and what that works out, and then going back to the Vitruvian man and actually creating an idea of proportion in which arm proportion to, to body, to navel, to head. And of course, that has had a huge influence on architecture. So we have doors and we have spaces that are based on, on body dimensions, right? Seats all based on ergonomics and so on and so forth. Or even the facades of buildings being based on tripartites of body and um, position. But if we start thinking of the body not just on how we understand our sensory perception, so human senses, whether that be taste, vision, um, olfactory, there's a huge list that go beyond a kind of five basic understanding of senses. But if we start looking into artificial senses, um, so still things that are vision, taste, and scent, but maybe things that we don't have access to, but we could, we could embellish, or artificial senses that have nothing to do with our species, but instead are borrowed from things like bats, like echolocation, and of course, pharmaceutical. And trying to figure out, if we can start thinking about our body being tuned like that, we go from this idea of thinking about the more you know about the body, circulatory system, optics, genetic sequencing, and then how we can control that, meaning now we know about the body, so early, early going, bringing this back to the conversation about um, space and the, sh the space shuttle, it's like early examples of what we were doing with the Gemini program on Apollo, testing the human body to its outer limits, so we understand that we can move them into new environments. Environments here on Earth, but then environments in outer space. Is instead you get this, this kind of arms race in which both the perception of the body and the materials that we're working with are kind of open for design. And one isn't a priori. One doesn't, doesn't want the knowledge of one doesn't then produce the production of the second. So when you think about architectural space, you think about these gradients meaning they don't work like walls and geometries in the sense that you can't, you don't abstract the same way if you're working in, for students who are working in CAD, Rhino, Maya, whatever it is, SolidWorks, or sketching on a pen and paper, it's for the most part those lines always, rec always symbolize or represent geometry. They become geometry. But in reality, when you're looking at anything that's tied to an energy, it, it functions as a gradient. And so whether that be a gradient of energies whether that be the sensorial envelope of how the body perceives its environmental input, and then architecture being that interaction between the two, in which the body and the energy come in contact with each other to produce architectural form and architectural shape. Uh, I'm going to just go over this quickly because it'll, it'll pop up again. But one of the, the intriguing things about this is that when you start thinking about the environment and you start thinking about energy as an architecture, it doesn't have uh, a, a stasis. So for the most part, if you're thinking about architecture in terms of geometries, that boundary doesn't change. I mean, if a, if a storm comes or something comes and destroys it, of course it, it changes. But for the most part, that wall and that boundary stay, stay the same. But when you're talking about energy, you're thinking about like a campfire or street light, that, that edge changes based on external properties. So even a street light, same amount of light being produced Depending on whether it's a new moon or a full moon, that edge will change. So if there's, there's no light around, that'll be a hard, distinct edge. If there's a full moon and a lot of the light is sort of ambient in the area, it'll actually be um, looser because there's a lot of ex extra light around it. Or a campfire, build a fire, have a, have a degree of temperature and warmth and light. Cold wind comes in and that gets smaller. Now, that's the same thing with any type of forms of, of energy systems. The question is, how do you deal with that? Do you, do you give way to that ground and let that ground disappear? Or if it's important, do you maintain the boundary but have to increase energy at some other level to offset that external environment? So E is the environment, X, sorry, E is the, uh, the energy of, of the space, X is the environment, and when one increases, one would decrease. You could make, each one of these are idea of maintaining a, geom a space, physical space, but ha realizing that the, the aesthetics of it would likely change because just like a campfire, if you put more fuel on to hold that boundary, the color of the flame would change. And so you start to get these realizations that, in an odd way, you get a vernacular. Because climatically, that environment is unique to the con context that it's in. So that same project that's produced in, in Maine, moved to Guadalajara, Mexico, is going to perform completely differently. Because they don't have the same environmental context.
And so just as a couple of projects to kind of show some of these ideas, um, this was a series of photographs that I had, I had done for the design uh, biennial in uh, Istanbul. And what I wound up doing, and this kind of goes into a conversation of how to, how, how to work for me personally, and is really not even just jumping scales, but actually jumping medium. So in this case, these were physical models. This is a bit autobiographical, but after that book, I was completely zonked out and thought maybe I didn't have the ability to design anymore. <laughs> like if I had spent so much time writing, maybe that, that thing that allows me to design has disappeared. And so instead of waiting for a, a design project to come my way, I decided just to create these kind of design projects where these are just physical models that are mocked up uh, in the office as a way of presenting uh, new typologies, working with energy systems, one of them, which is on the wall there, um, and then taking photographs of them that could then be embellished. And so this one, this is a, an Odom diagram, which is a, a diagram pr produced by a gentleman named Odom in the late 60s and 70s, who was looking at not just energy, but, but systems of information and how that moves in and out of territory. So this would be a drawing that could be done for the city of London, you know, you build a perimeter, it doesn't have to be a political boundary, but it could be a boundary of trade, it could be a boundary of, of network connectivity, it could be whatever it is, it's about information coming in and out and where that boundary between the two are created. In this case, it's being used for energy, the shape of an energy. And so what you have in black are all the things that are producing energy, whether they be uh, electromagnetic field, um, uh, various spectrums of light, uh, some of the uh, dehumidifying the uh, air vapor, and then everything in white is the existing context. And everything in that white comes in contact with the thing from the energy. Think of it as a more, a more embellished campfire. It's the same thing. It's like the thing that produces energy, the thing from the outside that, that pushes pressure on it. And that, where the two come meet, then becomes the architectural form. That's the shape of architecture. It's where thermal properties from the environment meet thermal properties being produced. And you get this kind of shape. And so these were just a series of drawings in which they were abstracted as Odom diagrams and then produced as physical, physical models that were then kind of altered a little bit. And so this is just a way of thinking, what if you had these, these series of base plates in an open landscape, uh, and then you had these kind of drone systems that could find their mark, they would locate home to the position and produce a little microclimate that could be used by a series of individuals and maybe even tuned to those individuals so that someone from the outside may not even perceive them or may not even access them. And so you, you get these kind of unique environments that could then go away without being, um, leaving a heavy mark on the landscape. And so this becomes a, a subset which I'll talk about in a little bit, which is the pressure in which, how do we think as designers and architects about our public space when technology from the environment, technology from wearables are gonna have a huge influence on our public space, how do we kind of get ahead of the curve to actually do stuff like this? Uh, just another one in which there are a series of people sitting here and then somebody enters the space and how that space changes based on a, a, a new person in there. And so what you're seeing here is that example of this, is, this, is, this could be 10 minutes apart, this could be two weeks apart. But the idea is that the environmental context of the things that are in white have changed. And when they change, the, architectural shape, shape changes. So um, if the context gets cooler or windier or what have you, it could actually make the shape go from, from, from one thing to another. Uh, this is a, another project. This is um, the amplification project. And what uh, I was looking at here was this is a this is in Los Angeles, and this is in the Mac Center, so Schindler's House, uh, which was uh, done in the 20s. And it was an exhibition that was put on um, by OSA architects. And each architect had a different room, and I wound up taking the garden, which ironically, if, if you're familiar with this house, is probably most identified as from the landscape. But in truth, it's actually something that came in 20 years after the building was built. It's something that they couldn't afford to put in. So the architect, of course, spent more on the massing and then worried about the landscape 20 years later, 10 years later. And so what these were are a series of boxes um, made out of acrylic that all have the same uh, exact geometry, but actually behave differently. 
over a course of an hour or 24 hours or two weeks. And so what you look at here is six identical shapes that then have uh, different climactic environments within them. And so this was the control system in which there's nothing in here other than the cubicle. Um, and then some had vegetation and, and a various of other series of parameters, which I'll, I'll show. And so then these are, these are two um, computational fluid CFD models, one for a thermal and one for air velocity, um, just to kind of get an understanding of how this would work, where the thermal properties would be, um, how it would move, and then how the air velocity could actually pull that and move that around. And of course, a lot of this work goes back to this idea of creating a prototype at this scale, doing a simulation at this scale, then doing a prototype that doesn't work like the simulation said it was going to, then doing another pr prototype. So it's really a realization that the software or the technology that you're using isn't always going to give you an answer. It actually has to be a dialogue between the physical prototyping you're making and, and the technology you're, you're using. And so each one of these has, has a series of things where you have the, the acrylic container, you have, uh, these are planters. You have, um, within this large base, which is filled with water, you have um, fans, you have a series of two lights, a heating system, um, and then this is a kind of plastic base that was vacuum formed below, aluminum structure. And the, the water itself actually used a, a colored dye, and that colored dye was used to um, it's used for, like, for testing and understanding where water is moving in a large system. So you may have a, a creek over here, but then you get water a quarter mile away, and you're trying to figure out, is that coming from the same location or a new location? You can actually put this in the water, and then when you shine ultraviolet light on it, it turns dark, it turns solid. So if something goes from being translucent, then you change the spectrum of light that moves through it, and it becomes opaque. And so each one of these did something slightly differently, where um, one of them may have, um, like we mentioned, was a, 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 like a, um, a control one that had none of those systems. One may have the heating and lighting. One might have the fan heating and lighting. And they would be turned on at different temperatures so that as you move through here, even though they looked identical in form, the six of them actually behaved completely differently. Some would turn on if you went through them for a period of time. Some would turn on and off. So the one that was... Um, the control, you know, as the sun would come in during the day and, and kind of push all that heat up like a greenhouse and create the condensation and then go dormant during the, the evening while others would stay active. And so the idea was really not to put the onus on the geometry, but try to figure out uh, how we can control those interiors. And what I'm going to close with here are um, a bit of a shift. And it's not official. The paperwork hasn't come back completely, but I figured I'd talk about it anyway, which is the name of the office is Weathers. And I'm actually taking a change now to um, another company called Open Weathers. The idea being is that it's going to be a nonprofit 501c3 as a way of trying to engage these technologies and these conversations, not through a for-profit model, but hopefully as a way of, of engaging, um, engaging industry, engaging community that are going to be a part of this without having to think about it as, um, as a for-profit model. And so if you look at something like, like this, which we just talked about, these different examples, one in kind of in a, in a snow condition, one in an open landscape, um, and this being the various technologies involved, some of them being wearable, some of them being um, things that you could purchase through Philips, through GE, through Herman Miller. These are all technologies that, are, that, are, that exist, but they usually exist in other disciplines. They usually exist for furniture, they exist for healthcare, they exist for a, a range of things. And the idea is to start talking and, and making connections where what if we looked at this purely as a healthcare provider? What if we looked at the landscape in our city parks, not simply as a place that you walk in or you get sunlight or that you get green grass or you get openness and you can convene with people, but what if the landscapes actually started doing things like being preventative medicine? What if you could actually control spectrums of light so that during cold winters, in which you're not getting enough sunlight, something like the landscape doesn't just give you ideal conditions of color and light for a good rainy day, a good more um, sunlight, but actually can be a way in which you can get vitamin D and work for seasonal affective disorder, depression, uh, furnishing an urban landscape, working with a series of other precedents, or, or whether it's education, or the idea of trying to overlap these together. But to do this, though, the attempt is to start having conversations with industry. So this is just a sampling of some of those. So if we're, whether you're looking at things tied to the material energies, or whether you're talking about sensory perception, you're looking at a, a, a wide range. That, and again, these are not, the conversation here isn't about 
um, fictional futures. The idea is that this, is, this is exists now, it's just that it's not being implemented in the architecture or in landscape in the same way that it could be. And so if you could have a conversation with healthcare or furniture, agricultural technologies, this is a huge area in which sensor systems are being deployed in which farmers can actually allow tractors through GPS, allow um, drone systems to actually put in um, pesticides, which they don't have to interact with them, or they can maximize the efficiency of it. Clean energy, again, healthcare, fitness. Some of this is about actually working with tech that exists, and some of it is about working with technology that may be going in one direction, but could potentially go in another direction if, the, if you can show opportunities for it. And th these are just different typologies, meaning this could be something that's done more as a, as a ground cover or something that's more like outdoor furniture. So it doesn't have to be holding to any one design. And, and in doing this, what we're, we're, again, trying to figure out is how can we converge tech from other industries? How do we deploy it in kind of novel ways? We can test it and analyze it. And I'll, I'll walk through this project quickly. Um, then we project, meaning what are some of the social implications on public space? What would be the environmental impact if we did this? What are some of the market potentials for public and urban infrastructure? And then report on this. So this doesn't go just back to corporations, this goes back to the city. This goes back to the people who run the park systems. And I'm bringing this up because, at least in Chicago, this is a real problem in which I live in a state um, that hasn't had a budget in three years, um, in, which, in which a city needs to make revenue. And if that revenue is gonna come from selling the parking meters, then they're gonna sell the parking meters. If it comes from selling government buildings, they're gonna sell government buildings. What's next on that list? Probably allowing the same corporations to sort of monetize public space. I mean, this is already happening. So does that happen without our knowledge? Does that happen where we can actually, as designers, get ahead of it and understand what those implications could be? Meaning, I'm not trying to be dystopic here. So like the idea of Climate Corporation is a company that has recently been purchased by Monsanto. And Climate Corporation does is they take satellite images of your property as a farmer, and they can tell you when to put nitrogen in the soil. They knew this, A, through satellite imagery of the best time, so you, don't, you maximize it, but they also do it by taking core samples of your property. And by taking core samples, they understand the soil layout of your property, and they also know the maximum value of your property, meaning you can't really negotiate, I mean, they can actually put a final price tag on what it's capable of, because they understand both through imagery as well as through core sampling. Um, that sounds really great in terms of maximizing agriculture, if that same corporation comes in and sort of thinking about public space in terms of where it's where there's more soil, less soil, more moisture, less moisture, more sun, less sun, these all become conversations that can easily become monetized. And public space doesn't become about if you can get to it, it's public and accessible. It's about depending on your healthcare provider, depending on the technologies you can purchase of a cell phone or, or a smartphone, you start to actually interact with public space completely differently. And so this, the attention here is that can the architect, can the designer get ahead of that and actually start, through design, actually create spaces that people want to use, but at the same time start foreshadowing what some of those pressures might be. And so one of them here, this is a project called uh, Boulders, not very imaginative. Um, and these are half-scale uh, prototypes now, so these are each about um, 18 inches, 20 inches maybe. Um, and what you're looking at here is these are concrete structures that then have a heating coil system inside and then have these lenses that hold various um, lighting technologies within them. The idea here is that this is just a small prototype of it, but with something like this is that not only does this produce heat that is conductive as you sit on it, it produces a form of radiation so you could, you could be near it and, and feel some of that heat, particularly in Chicago when we have such active public spaces, such public parks, where from right around now until September, they'll be jam-packed with activities and they'll go completely dormant in the rest of the winter because it's so cold and they can't be used. And so if you can actually start thinking about manipulating the microclimate in such a way where not only can people sit and actually enjoy some of these smaller microclimates, the excess heat that goes from here to here would actually warm the soil and actually allow vegetation to grow in those spaces. So you produce these little microclimates. A little bit like the streetlight example is, this isn't intended to reproduce a natural condition, so the streetlight doesn't reproduce the sun, it produces something completely different. This again is not intended to reproduce Chicago in June 2016. It's intended to produce a new kind of unnatural, natural condition that people could use in a kind of smaller scale 
uh, to engage and eventually be able to think about how, how they engage it. So if this is a kind of concrete structure that has this electrical system running through it that then has the mechanical or the, the wiring below it using lighting like this that could work from healthcare and lighting and infrared and sound from Herman Miller or what have you it actually could be embedded in here and these just being kind of thermal imaging uh, tests just to understand the external temperature that these could get to for the human body. And then again, tying these two to existing things. So looking at uh, everything from light to scent to, to sound, and then tying those to actually technologies that exist out there and trying to find ways of, of misusing them. So the same way we're talking about iron, steel, or glass, or plastic. Like how do we misuse some of these technologies for the benefit of, as, through the lens of a designer or the architect in terms of how we create and manipulate space. Sometimes it's just fun to make more models. This is a short one, but it's within the same system. And so it should be said that one of the reason that these are in the, the park systems is trying to make relationships with the Chicago Parks District as a way of saying, um, you have a park system that runs throughout the Chicago, runs through lots of different neighborhoods from more wealthy areas like um, Lincoln Park all the way into um, the south side and beyond into the west side. And how can that be used as an infrastructure for, for people and communities? So this is a, what I found interesting about this one is this is, so this is the Hancock here. This is Oak Beach. This, um, this is actually, an, this was just produced last year. It's a completely new park. It's six acres. They were having water uh, from the lake pushing too hard, pushing into, onto the streets and the areas around here, and it was causing too much flooding. So they added six acres here as a way of curbing that. It's just a big piece of grass. And so the idea was to say, what if we did more than that, but what if we could actually produce a landscape in which you think of a circuit board, in which all we do is take a circuit board, put it below grass, whether it be turf or a seed, and allow that grass to actually tune and, and both record um, moisture, temperature from the variables that they're afraid of here, which is from the lake as an issue of flooding, but also in terms of thermal and sound. So these could become small microclimates that would be tuned to an individual. And so this becomes a kind of small device that then has a heating and light element within it. It would then have um, various wiring systems, much like the electrical system, that would then be embedded in the ground, either plug and play in the sense that it would be a lot like a, a turf, that you could actually just slip it into the turf as the turf is laid out, or thrown down with seed grass. But nonetheless, these are, these are um, Silicon plastic that just allows you to kind of rub your hands over them. They're not hard texture. You can actually lay down on them, um, but they give out a spectrum of light. And this is just one, one scenario of it. And so that, you know, that, and that becomes the kind of the big question here is then how, how does this not become simply a project about implementing technology? You know, how is it not simply about deploying novel forms, but at the same time realizing that those are interesting topics. I mean, as a designer, we are interested in aesthetics. We are interested in, in form and shape. But I think we're also interested in trying to figure out, speaking personally, on how we can create new typologies, you know, new ways in which people can engage and tie to current uh, social pressures that actually can be opportunities. And so and they range in quite a bit of ways. So some of those opportunities might be the malleability and tunable space. So much like street lighting or other outdoor microclimates, these forms of energy can be quickly manipulated to be turned on or off, made stronger or weaker, flexible for creating and removing material presence is a unique quality of this future architecture. And I'm just saying this because I'm trying to switch what usually becomes the question, which is, isn't this just a form of entropy? If you turn something on, it heats, and then it goes away. Isn't that a giant problem? You're just heating the outdoor landscape, or you're just lighting the outdoor landscape. But the flip side of it is what the, the real power of, say, street lighting within the city parks is that when you don't need light, you don't have it on. And when, you, when someone is, if you, if you take that to the next level and talk about people sitting in public space, is that this isn't turned on all the time. Is that as somebody approaches it, who very well through Bluetooth, phone, uh, or whatever, you could actually tune yourself or your, your kind of healthcare needs, your climactic needs, whatever it is that you're unique to you, that this would then be tuned to and would allow you to actually have a small space here that differs from Sally's over here or John's over there or it turns off altogether differently because someone's using it at all. 
And so that malleability or that entropy actually can become a benefit to the system. Um, updatable. So when such a large percentage of the architecture's shape comes from the energy released, it's the small technological devices, the light bulb, in the architectural system that can easily update as technology advancements and energy manipulation and efficiency increase. And so, again, going back to the street lighting, is that you have an incandescent bulb or, or gas bulb. When LED comes about, you don't have to change the entire infrastructure. You change simply the bulb. And there's a real, I didn't unfortunately put it in here, I was thinking about it, but there's a great picture of Los Angeles that just made in the last couple of years the shift from one lighting system to another. And if you've been to LA or lived there, I think the idea, this idea of the city as a kind of yellow landscape is probably one that comes to mind. But now it's a white landscape because it's with an LED filter, the entire night landscape of LA has completely changed. And that's an updatable system, meaning you don't always necessarily need to change the entire infrastructure of wiring, electricity, and, and power, and, um, and pole systems. You actually are just changing the, um, the smaller technological advancement in terms of whether it's efficiency or actually being able to add new energy systems to it. So evolving social experience. Much like two individuals might today have different access to the internet, reception based on separate cellular providers and equipment, individual access and ability to perceive sensory information will vary along social economic status, technological demographics, and health, making the same public space unique among multiple users. So I'm trying to give examples that may hit home, which is if you're on the subway, you're underground, this happens from time to time now at home, is that one person's still talking and your phone has stopped. Like you've lost cellular, cellular access, but the person next to you has not. They may have a different provider, they may have a different phone, but nonetheless, you're cut off and they're not. That's an analogy, though, that can very well make its way, obviously, to the outside when you move up above. It's the same way in which traffic data is produced. That traffic data is just tracking the movement of phones. And when all the phones on highway stop moving, they know there's traffic. And that traffic then gets put back into your phone, so you know you're standing still. Um, but we like to think that with public space, that um, um, accessibility Handicap accessibility, being able to get people to physical places, allowing um, public transportation to get you to a spot. If those two hurdles can be overcome, that then public space is universal. But public space is, is not universal and in a lot of different political ways. But one of the ones that I, th I don't think we're really preparing for is the fact that through healthcare and through technology, access to information means access to, to, to space. And so if through technology you can sense different different energy systems or different climates. Just the example I gave you about, about that landscape in which you could tune yourself to it. If you don't have that healthcare, if you don't have that provider, you don't have that software, you don't have access to that public space. And that becomes a big issue. And we know that today, uh, say things like high-speed high internet access is not a luxury, it's a requirement. Because if you want to get a job, you have to apply online. Yet in the United States, something like 20% of all Americans don't have access to high-speed internet. That's usually in a rural area, but sometimes on the outskirts of city, city boundaries. And so access to tech and what that means is actually stratifying uh, public space. Uh, and then ethical and moral dilemmas. So just ethical and moral issues inevitably arise when you willfully manipulate both global climate and human physiology. Um, it's through these spatial scenarios that potential outcomes can most completely be explored. So it's also not to say that any of these are ideal systems or th these are ideal conditions. It's to say, though, that these are tough questions that need to, be, have, need to be answered. And they're not purely technological problems. They're social problems. They're spatial problems. And so how do we kind of test these things out? How do we kind of get ahead of the game plan? And I think most importantly, and things that, that, that interest me the most that kind of started me on this, this is what I'm going to end with, is um, new conversations about environmental change. And this is reminiscent or goes back to that first conversation about the hieroglyph project and science fiction. Um, which this work seeks to give energy a public face and excites and inspires the progressive discussion about our inevitable changing environments and our architecture's public role. In a sense that when we think about sustainability, when we think about conservation, and we, we think about these in terms of moral good, we do wind up shutting the conversation down. Because it, it, it is a conversation about making yesterday can t exist continually, and we know that's not possible. So this is about being able to have a conversation that um, could actually entice the general public to want to know more about these conversations. Meaning, if they, we know that when you put pressure on people, when people 
codify, um, commodify something, when people covet it, they want it, there's pressure usually to produce more of it. And the idea is hopefully if we can have conversations about energy and about bioengineering in the body and what this is doing, that this can actually move its way not within purely um, technological conversations, not just along policy or not just along architecture and design, but actually can, can kind of thread uh, some of those conversations together. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you.